Hello everyone and welcome to the Ashley Young Center's Dissecting DSM-5, What You Need to Know, presented by Dr. Stephen Buser. Speaking today will be Dr. Stephen Buser and myself, your AJC host, Ryan Deacon. And today is a webinar. It's the first event of our clinical webinar series. It will be 90 minutes long uh, with no break today. Um, this is the third webinar with video and audio chat that we've used so far. And you'll be able to ask questions from any computer using the chat feature on the bottom left. Um, we may also, or we will also open up a couple cameras and uh, microphones to hear from a few people as well. Um, so with that going, we need to make sure your audio settings are correct. Uh, look on the upper left corner under my video. You'll see two choices, mic and speaker or telephone. And that's under the audio drop menu. Um, if you have any questions, please email us, uh, info at ashwelljungcenter.org. And your microphones are all muted, so don't worry about that. Please do explore the features. There's a full screen mode. That's a button near the top right. You can also enlarge the presenter video in the slides as well if you need to. And um, you find those on the bottom right of your screen. Uh, you want to make sure that you have the full window open. Um, and we highly encourage asking questions using the chat feature. We have a couple webinars coming up. Uh, Lifting the Veal featuring Jane Kimmerling. That's going to be next Friday. That'll be very interesting. It'll be a two-hour webinar from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. And then we will have our next Dissecting DSM-5 webinar on mood disorders, and that will be July 9th. Um, we're going to start having our series on Tuesday, and we're thinking about doing it monthly. Um, uh, we got a very great response, and we'll talk about that later. Uh, but Tuesday, July 9th from 8 to 9.30 p.m. I need to let everybody know that we have no commercial support for the presenters, topics, or programs. There's no pharmaceutical industry support of any kind associated with us today. And there will be an online survey coming out right after this. Uh, when you get that in your email, please fill it out for us. Uh, recording warnings, we will be taping today. So if you'd like to ask your questions anonymously, please email them to info at actualyoungcenter.org. Um, if you're a little braver, you can type it in the chat box. Uh, we can all see the questions that you put down there, so please uh, remember that. And if you don't want to be uh, recorded, please don't let us open your mic and video if you ask a question. Um, please note that comments or questions in the chat box will be visible for everybody here on the recorded video. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Steve Buser and dissecting DSM-5. All right. Thank you, Ryan. We'll go ahead and pull up the, the slide decks. This is our second webinar in, in this series. We tried this uh, once before with this new software, and we're pretty excited to see some of the features. I think you'll see that coming together as well. We chose today for DSM-5 because today is one of the official release dates. It was leaked out a little bit earlier at the APA, American Psychiatric Association, uh, conference this last week, and some of the books won't actually hit the, the mail until next week, but we're right in the, the middle of the release of the book, and that's one reason why we decided to do that today. Uh, one question, DSM-5 or DSM-5? If those of you who remember the old DSM is the DSM-2, 3, and 4 all had uh, kind of Roman numerals with that. And this one is Jane and Jason 5. So that's a minor change, but it's an interesting one. That's one that people will probably notice as they possibly get the books. We're going to start with the poll question. And Ryan, go ahead and, and pull up that, that poll question. You'll see we have about six or I don't know exactly many, you know, five to seven poll questions throughout you know, an hour and a half a day. And this one is just one to let us know who's attending today. And so go ahead and click through. Are you a psychologist, social worker, licensed counselor, psychiatrist, physician, other health care worker, or just other? Um, feel free to not take the survey if you'd rather not, but click through that and we'll just take a quick look to see you know, who's participating today. That's partly to help me guide the discussion, depending on kind of who's here. There's probably a fair number of clinicians who are the ones that are most impacted by the ASM5 piece. And Ryan has popped that on the screen. I think you can see that. Looks like we've got a fair number of psychologists. About 31% of us are psychologists. 10% uh, social workers, 20 licensed counselors, 10% psychiatrists, myself included, and 20% other 
Okay, well, good, thanks. That gives really our whole audience a sense of uh, who's here and, and, and what we're doing. So we'll go back to the slides in a moment and get back to DSM-5. Okay, so let's go to our next slide. Um, some of this we've said already, but I want to reiterate it because it's fairly important. Um, remember your name that you typed in could be on the chat box, the attendee list. I don't think that's a problem for people, but just so you know that it's that's in there. Your emails are not. You probably put in your email, but your emails are not visible by uh, anybody you know, attending the conference. Remember this is recorded, so don't say anything you don't want recorded, either in typing or in uh, video and audio. And most importantly, I want to open this up to questions as you go along, and I want people to feel free to ask clinical questions. So patients they might have seen, difficult diagnostic cases, or cases that might be changed by the new DSM-5. And that is fine to talk about, but nothing uh, confidential. So no identifying data, uh, speak more in hypotheticals or patients you know, as if they've had certain symptoms. Please don't give any information that could be identified as a specific patient. I think everybody knows that. No clinician would really do that in this day and age. But I wanted to get that warning out there nonetheless. We have a very special welcome to the Evanston Young Center. They are participating as a uh, formed group, meaning that in addition to all the individual computer participants today, the Evanston Young Center, just outside of Chicago, has a number. We haven't gotten an exact number. Uh, Jessica, type in the number of, of people that you have at your site. That'll be interesting to you. see how many people in the room. Just type in the number of people that are in the Evanston Young Center room and get a chance. Um, but anyway, they are participating as a group site, meaning that we can open up their video during questions. Uh, their group of people can ask questions directly. We want to make that an open invitation. If you have a young center or a group of people and you would like to join one of our future seminars that way, uh, please think about doing so. Email us. We split any proceeds. Any money that that's raised goes both to cover our overhead, but half will go to your local group as well. So it's a nice way to have community and to funds. And Jessica has written 24. Excellent. So Evanston has 24 people. So currently that's uh, about a third, I would say. Yeah, about a third of the people joining us are in Evanston, which is kind of nice. Good. So thank you again. Hope this works out well for you and us. All right. So the history of DSM. We're going to dive into our, our talk now. This is the DSM-5, so this is the fifth uh, edition of the Diagnostic Statistical Manual, Mental Disorders. And I want to talk uh, in a moment about kind of the history behind it. But our, our next poll question, and Ryan, you can go ahead and pull up that poll question, is what's your overall thoughts about DSM-5? Meaning, uh, are you excited that DSM-5 has come out? Do you see it as a good thing? It's an update that kind of needs to happen. The old one was almost 20 years old. Uh, or do you see DSM-5 as really unneeded, DSM-4 being just fine? Um, or do you not like DSM at all? Do you think the whole idea of DSM should be abandoned? Um, we'll talk about kind of that controversial piece you know, as well. So just pick one, two, or three. Uh, Jessica, do a, a show of hands and maybe just type in in the chat if you can. Uh, how many you saw with that, and we'll uh, get the, the sense of how many people in Emerson feel that way. Because uh, that's one of the, the controversies. There's a lot of sub-controversies, and we'll talk about Asperger's and diagnostic blurring and other pieces, but a significant controversy is, is DSM-5 appropriate? Is it needed? And is it a good or bad thing? There's been a lot of news stories out there about that. So let's go ahead and close the, the poll, and there it is. So 45% majority say yes, 20 years without a significant update is far too long. 6% uh, said it was just fine, and a whopping 35% say it should be abandoned altogether. And that's an interesting thought. Um, from Evanston, uh, nine people thought the, the top one, that it was good about time. One thought it was just fine, three uh, abandoned. So pretty similar, maybe a little bit more in Evanston thought that DSM-5 was a good thing. Of course, there's sampling error. Those of you who are attending the seminar might be more interested in DSM-5 than maybe while you're on it. Nonetheless, uh, that is interesting that most people are sort of pro, and the ones that are against DSM-5 are more against DSM altogether. 
and I certainly can understand that as well. Okay, I want to talk about the history of DSM, and it really goes back about 100 years. You can even bring it back farther if you'd like, but about 100 years ago, 1917 was the first kind of real clear uh, pre-DSM that I could find. This was from the what became the American Psychiatric Association. It wasn't called that then, but that was the organization. They call the Statistical Manual for the Use of Institutions for the Insane. I don't think you get by with that title nowadays. And there were, look at this, 22 diagnoses. So, boy, not many compared to our modern. But this was 100 years ago, our first reiteration, of really statistical analysis uh, of the institutions for the insane. DSM-1, so you'll see this is DSM-1. Of course, we're going to go through DSM-1 through 5. And I think it's interesting to see the history and how it came about. And, and that also goes into why do we have a, a newer DSM now and do we need one or not. So it was based off the U.S. Army and the World War II psychiatric report. It was revised uh, by the APA and coordinated with ICD-6. You'll recognize that currently we're in ICD-9. I'll talk about ICD-10 in a little bit. Um, but back then, 1952, we're on ICD-6. 130 pages, 106 mental disorder, so substantially more. They're focused on really historic terms, although we still use these terms as well, ego dystonic, ego syntonic, neuroses, et cetera. These are very psychodynamic you know, oriented terminology. That was DSM-1. DSM-2 came in in 1968. And I'd like somebody to type in their chat box uh, what controversy erupted in 1970, so two years after DSM, at the APA National Convention. So does anybody know what the controversy was in 1970? Got a lot of news media, for those of you who remember uh, that time, and type that in if you know the answer. I'll give you the answer in just a moment. Three people are typing right now. Uh, Len Cruz, homosexuality is not a disorder. Excellent, that's what the other people say. Um, yep, Kathy says homosexuality, and a few others are typing good. So uh, ICD-8 was DSM-2, a little bit longer, a little more diagnosis, still very psychodynamic, so Freudian Psychodynamic psychotherapy was still the, the mainstay. Cognitive behavioral therapy wasn't really big back then. There were still thoughts such as neurosis and psychosis. And sure enough, Len and Kathy and Jessica you know, all got the correct answer, which indeed you know, is homosexuality. Uh, gay activists disrupted the 1970 you know, APA National Convention in San Francisco. And it makes sense that there'd be some interest there with it. And DSM-2 was actually actually rewritten in 1974, so a few years later, and took out homosexuality as a mental disorder. And obviously that was quite offensive to some people to have homosexuality as a mental disorder. Um, and we'll actually talk about that towards the end of the, the slides. DSM-5 actually goes back to this, this issue as well, more of the gender identity disorder. Uh, should gender identity be a disorder, whereas gender identity uh, something else, and we'll talk about gender dysphoria, which is a DSM-5 piece, but we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, and, and what you'll see, and you'll see it in DSM-5 as well, is that a lot of the evolution of DSM is really uh, also includes politics, so what's politically appropriate and what's not. Uh, mental retardation is still a diagnosis as of a week ago, but as of this week, no longer is. Intellectual development disorder will be uh, replacing uh, mental retardation. And you can see why that term has become kind of charged within our, our society now. Okay, DSM-3, and this is the one I remember. When I was a medical student at Duke back in 85, yeah, back in 1985, again, medical school, DSM-3 was the, the one that we had. I still have that copy of DSM-3. Uh, and that's what I was trained on. DSM-3 brought in the multi-axial, so axis one through five. So for the last 30 years, up until this week, that's a change as well, we've had a multi-axial you know, system. It was consistent with ICD-9, which is interesting because that's the same current reiteration. DSM-5 is still using ICD-9. Most of the world went to ICD-10 10, 10 years ago, but the United States is holding out until next October. Uh, but currently is still ICD-9. DSM-3 was less psychodynamic, so some new forms of psychotherapy were coming out. 
uh, around that time, or at least becoming more popular, I should say, more descriptive, trying to be more criterion-based, much longer, 494 pages, 265 diagnoses. So you can really see it and move forward with that. DSM-3R was a, a moderate you know, rewrite, uh, not as much as a full edition, but it was significant. That came out in 1987. I remember I was in medical school when that one came out as well, and uh, also bought a copy of that. Still correlates, of course, with ICD-9. It was reorganized, some changes were made, and you can see the pages you know, growing uh, to some degree you know, as well. DSM-4, and, and this is what most everybody <clears throat> on the webinar most likely is quite used to, 1994. So that's almost 20 years. So 20 years ago, DSM-4 came out. And you can see that's a bigger gap compared to the other DSMs, by and large, as they were coming out. So it's unusual that we had you know, really 20 years of relative quiet in the DSM changes. It, of course, still correlates to ICD-9, as is DSM-5 currently. This one was a bit of a bigger project that 13 work groups that created 13 sections. We still have those work groups for DSM-5, 886 pages, so it's growing, more diagnoses, and it was a pretty major revision of the diagnoses uh, and criteria. So DSM-4 was, uh, I guess, really the modern uh, one that, that people are kind of so used to now. DSM-4-TR, uh, this one, <laughs> Some would say it was a dud. It really didn't change things much. There were essentially no changes except uh, text revision. So the diagnostic criterion, which is the mainstay of uh, how we think about diagnoses, really wasn't changed much at all. So um, to be honest, I, this is one I didn't buy. I never bought a copy of DSM or TR and really didn't see it as, as much of a significant change. Most people probably didn't. If you disagree with that, type in the, the chat button and we can talk about that. Um, oh, ICD, there is a question about ICD. What does ICD? Um, and I'm sorry about that. That's, I'm taking that for granted. At some point, I think I've written it out. Um, but ICD is the International Classification of Diagnoses. Um, I might not have that exactly correct, but it's, it's all about the, uh, why I abbreviate it as DX, so the diagnostic piece. And that's really uh, for all the medicine. So if you have a strep throat, there's a very specific ICD code for strep throat and for coronary artery disease and diabetes. And, and literally the manual is, you the camera, you know, that thick. It's a hugely thick manual of all the, the, the codes for all the medicine. And, and DSM is kind of blending more and more. You know, they often share the same codes. And for DSM-5, uh, it's also going to have the codes for ICD-10. So again, ICD is the diagnostic uh, codes that physician offices use and, and other offices as well. Okay. DSM-5 development work started in 1999, so a long time ago. And in 2006, David Kupfer, oops, sorry, I erased that. I want to X out his name. David might be watching and would be upset. But David Kupfer, MD, was named the chair of the task force to oversee DSM-5, so he was the main and of course, moving it forward. Again, 13 diagnostic work groups, just as the prior version were set up. The goals that were established uh, in the work groups between 2008 and 2012, as they were rewriting it, this is what they were trying to do. And that'll be one question today, were they successful in trying to rewrite these or not? Um, but they were trying to decrease the NOS diagnoses. Most of you from DSM-4 years remember bipolar disorder, NOS. NOS is not otherwise specified. So depression, NOS, eating disorder, NOS. NOS was kind of a catchment uh, diagnostic you know, category that if you couldn't uh, zero in on a specific one, the NOS got kind of made a, a generality. So they were trying to get rid of that because that's less uh, precise. That's an imprecise way. They're also adding a dimension of in, into the assessment with spectrum of illness. And we're going to talk a lot about that today. That's one change that's pretty significant that we're going to highlight a fair amount of. And then again, the ICD, they're trying to align DSM better with the ICD system. You know, currently nine, but it's almost ICD-10. And that'll be next year, ICD-10 will come out. 
And they're also trying to get a more evidence-based. You'll hear a lot in today's uh, journals about evidence-based medicine, and that's hard for psychiatry. We, you know, our, our, our science is a little bit fuzzier sometimes than some of the other ones, uh, but that's changing in the, the brain physiology and the neural mapping is progressing, but they try to make it more evidence-based if at all possible. So DSM-5 is released today, May 22nd, 2013. Uh, now, that's a little bit relative. They leaked out copies at their uh, APA conference uh, this week. So earlier this week and over the weekend, uh, folks that are at the American Psychiatric Association's conference in San Francisco, again, uh, received their releases early. So CNN and, and the others for the last few days have been reporting about it. But the official date was at least announced as today. That's why we decided to hold it today to honor that date. Some of the publishers, Amazon included, aren't releasing it until the 27th, I think. So if you've ordered a book through Amazon uh, and probably through the APA site, it'll be uh, May 27th, I'm told, before they're shipped. Um, but they're, they're here. Give or take a week, you know, we're right at it. Again, ICD-9 is the current code system still but ICD-10 comes out October 14th, and it's a big change. Any clinician that gets reimbursed for insurance is dreading October 2014, because these are, this is a huge change. It's not a, a minor change. Uh, and all the psychiatry codes begin in F, so they're F, blah, 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 but they're really uh, uh, challenging codes. And DSM-5, I'm told, I haven't seen the, the official copies yet, but we'll have ICD-9 in, in the print, but also ICD-10 in parentheses. So DSM-5 ought to have both sets of codes, both the ICD-9 and the 10. And it's 993 pages. Of course, probably depends on hardcover and whether you have a spiral bound or, or whatnot. So question, this isn't a poll, but type in any frustrated souls out there. As I was preparing this talk, I've been thinking over the last year and thinking, my gosh, we've had huge change in this year. So, and I was exhausted and even just thinking about it, uh, we had CPT change. That's the clinical procedure typology, maybe. Um, and that's how we get paid as well. So when we diagnose with an ICD-9 or DSM-5 code, we send this off for payment with a CPT charge. And that was all changed just a few months ago. It's been really a headache for most of us in private practice. Now this month, so just a few months later, DSM-5 is coming out. So that's another thing to learn. And then, gosh, next year, October 2014, ICD-10 is released. That's going to take a lot of rework. Then you add in there meaningful use, PQRS, HIPAA, Red Flag, ACA, the Affordable Care Act. Um, and I'm not going to go into what all these mean. So if you don't know what they mean, you're lucky because these are, are not fun. And if you do know what they mean, you're rolling your eyes in the back of your head saying, my gosh, how does anybody practice medicine or counseling or really uh, anything that uses these codes because it's getting more and more complex by that moment. Okay, so what are the biggest changes? Biggest changes that, that I see as I can review the material, biggest one, well, who knows what's bigger, but multi-axial system is abandoned. And that's a, a big change for the last uh, 20 years with the DSM-4 and much longer, if you include the earlier DSMs, we've been using a multi-axial system, you know, axis one, two, you know, three, et cetera, uh, and that is no longer there. The other major change is spectrum. We'll talk you know, a fair amount about that today, uh, but psychi psychiatric illness as a spectrum uh, is, is a shift that DSM-5 is, is moving into. So goodbye, axis one, two, and three. For the last 33 years since DSM-3, so that's a long time, um, I bet you very few clinicians, if you're a clinician that has been practicing more than 33 years, just type that in uh, the chat box. Uh, one, I'll be impressed, and two, I'll wonder if you remember you know, DSM-2. But for the last 33 years, we have uh, DSM-3 in the, in the five axes. By the way, CPT is current procedural terminology. Okay, so that was pretty close. Uh, and so the, the axes were one, two, three, four, five. And most all of you know this pretty well. If you knew uh, DSM-4, 
and I've been working with it, you're very used to access one, primary psychiatric disorders, access two, personality disorders, access three, medical disorders. And basically, all the first three will just be listed under diagnosis. So if you're evaluating a patient and you're writing the diagnostic, uh, the diagnoses down, you'll just list them all. And you might say major depression, uh, diabetes, high blood pressure, and probable narcissistic personality disorder. And that'll be a list, but no longer segregated into one, two, three. Psychosocial stressors won't be delineated any longer on axis four. And axis five, global assessment of functioning, is also no longer there. Not sure how that will work with uh, managed care. A lot of them want GAF. They get upset if you don't put it in, and they won't pay you if you're not tracking it. Uh, so we'll have to see how they respond to DSM-5. For, yeah, and for many of us, again, DSM-3 uh, and on, the, the multi axial system is really uh, ingrained in our, in our psyche. So DSM-5, now that drops the, the axial system, is really going back to DSM-1 and DSM-2 structure, which is where we just listed the diagnoses. Um, and, and this is really similar to the way a family practice, or really any you know, current physician, uh, non-psychiatric physician, would be already listing diagnoses. So when they submit bills, they just uh, submit them, and they don't define access one, two, three, four. And in their notes, they don't define it either. OK, poll question. Let's take a break for a poll question. Will you miss no longer having the five axes in the diagnoses uh, or not? So Ryan's going to pull that up. Uh, again, we've been using uh, multi-axial thinking for a long time. So take a moment and answer that. Will you, will you miss that? Possibility of yes. I feel the multi-axial system added a lot to my thought process of psychiatric functioning. Or no, I would be glad to let it go and have it more straightforward. And again, Jessica, if you can type in your results into the computer, uh, I'd like to hear what, uh, what y'all are thinking. In uh, Edmonton. And Ryan will close the poll in just a moment. We will see that. Here it is. Okay, so a minority said yes. I feel the multi axial system added a lot. And clearly, double that said no. I'll be glad to let it go and have it more straightforward. Well, good. Sounds like uh, a bunch of people like the DSM 5 you know, piece. And Evanston, a little bit more split, six yes and eight no. So eight, we're looking forward to it leaving, and six. But clearly, the majority are leaning towards uh, not having multi-axial. And of course, nothing stops you from thinking multi-axial. You can still write that in. You can still write assessment of functioning. Um, you just won't be doing it in a oops, official kind of way. Yeah, OK, so next. Uh, psychiatric illness as spectrum. So a, a, another interesting change, and, and I think a little bit more interesting, is that DSM-5 is trying to get away from black and white thinking. Uh, so black and white thinking is you have bipolar disorder or you don't have bipolar disorder. A spectrum would be more along the lines of how much bipolarity do you have. All of us have some level of bipolarity. Do you have a, a little bit? Do you have a lot? What, to what degree is, is bipolarity out there? Um, and we'll see that in different, in different diagnoses, not 100%. You don't have a 100% you know, spectrum you know, with it. And uh, yeah, we'll look at today. We'll spend you know, some handful of, of snapshots, really images and cartoons, kind of looking at that uh, to some degree. And this is actually controversial. And it's uh, controversial in, in the sense of previously, it was, again, real clear. You had the diagnosis or you didn't. With this spectrum approach, you can have mild, you can have moderate, you can have severe, or you can have a whole host of, of other you know, symptoms. And the, uh, the actual terminology of the code sometimes you know, vary. That was somewhat pre prevalent in DSM-4, but you'll see it's more the case in DSM-5. Um, the controversy is this could lead to an overdiagnosis of patients going through normal life stress. So we diagnose them with a mild, uh, bipolar or depression, but maybe that's just normal life stress. And we'll talk about more of that in a moment. So the, the question that is somewhat controversial is, does it pathologize normal behavior or does it normalize pathologic behavior? 
So what I'm referring to with that is say you have normal behavior and now we have a diagnostic code that says that's a mild expression of psychiatric illness X, then are we pathologizing something that's a normal behavior? The other way to look at it is you're normalizing pathologic symptoms. So we're saying we all have some level of bipolarity. It's just that most people have a very minimal you know, form of it. Um, so this could go either way, depending on, on, on how you view it. And my oversimplification of that is part of this controversy depends if you're a bean counter or a clinician. And here are the beans. So you could be a bean counter, and you'll see this person counting beans nice and neatly lined up. And of course, we all know Lucy is the prototypical psychiatric clinician. In fact, I have a, a small statue of her in my office. I could, in fact, it's right on the table behind me. You can't quite see it, but if you see that lamp you know, behind my ear, that's a, uh, underneath it is a statue of this. Anyway, um, being counter a clinician, what I'm referring to is if you're a statistician or a Medicare representative or an insurance company, you really like the, the bean counter approach, meaning you want clarity. Somebody has major depression or they don't have major depression. They have it, you'll reimburse uh, treatment for it, and they don't have it, you won't reimburse treatment for it. And if you're the CDC and you're trying to figure out the prevalence of major depression in the United States and you're counting beans for that reason, you're going to you know, really like that to find out is that bean in this category or is it in this category. These are the depression beans, these are the bipolar beans, these are the generalized anxiety beans. Now, if you're a clinician, like myself, you might actually like it better the, the other way, meaning that for any given patient, we don't have to pigeonhole them in a certain bean or a bean category. Um, we can say, you know, you have some symptoms of bipolarity, and this is where I see that in it, and some of our medication and psychotherapies will help improve uh, or worsen, you know, the broad variety. So I found the, the spectrum process very empowering to patients because it allows them to, to realize that we all have certain levels of symptoms. And those that go for treatment are hopefully the ones that just have a stronger expression of the treatment and are more symptomatic and need help. This is a cartoon of that idea. This isn't DSM-5 directly. Uh, there's no DSM-5 cartoon like this. But this is a cartoon that, that we put together actually a 11-year-old artist, you know, Luke. I won't mention his last name yet, so I'm not sure he wants it released. But Luke is an 11-year-old uh, local Asheville uh, elementary school you know, young man who is a marvelous artist, and I have requested him to draw some pictures. Any picture you see is from Luke you know, today. And for 11 years old, he does a pretty amazing job you know, with this. And what I asked Luke to do was to sketch out the spectrum idea. And for bipolar, this is our conceptualization. Again, this is taking DSM-5 one step further, but looking at the, the spectrum uh, more fully. And here you'll see a, a scale of creativity. So we have, bi we have boring versus bipolar. How much creativity do you have? So we're saying this is the boring end of the spectrum. If you have zero, you're very boring. And if you're 100, you have too much creativity. In fact, it's mania. And everybody on the planet is somewhere in this spectrum. You may be right here, and that's a real problem. If you're down here, let me change to a red pen just because I can. If you're down here, you're a boring, kind of stuck in the mud and, you know, guy. And, and that's a problem. And these people, we try to jazz up and try to get them, you know, higher up the scale. We try to move them up and get them less in this problematic area and more lively, more spontaneous, more creative. Uh, if you're over here, this is a problem too. This would be full mania. And this is what you see you know, on the movies and television. Somebody's at 100 or near 100. You know, they're fully manic. You see some dollar signs there. They're spending too much money. They're uh, hyper running fast. And that's a problem. They may be losing money, losing jobs, losing spouses. And those people we try to move down back into the less dangerous, back into this white you know, zone. Medications can move you down. Psychotherapy can move you down. Sometimes time moves you down. Then we have the in-betweens, which are the more creative. So you're more creative than this boring guy right there. Uh, you may be the life of the party, kind of energetic, and we arbitrarily pick that person at 46, so kind of right there. Maybe a talented artist, very creative. There's a Parisian you know, gentleman painting a picture there, perhaps the Mona Lisa, uh, although that wouldn't be Parisian. But anyway, that person is right here. Uh, but 
if he starts getting a little bit too much there, he might start cutting his ear off or doing other unusual artistic pieces, in which case we want to try to get him back down here. And what I found is that this system, let me go ahead and erase that, this system is uh, highly empowering for patients. And if we say, we're not trying to give you medication to get rid of your creativity there and bring it all the way down here, no. Our goal is to get you somewhere in here. Still more creative than average, so still above 50, but not in this dangerous where you're losing your job and getting fired and having affairs or spending too much money. So we're trying to get you into the creative uh, in the center area of that. So this is an example of what I see as the, the helpful aspect of bipolar. We're actually going to do a number of talks on this. We're going to break down DSM-5 and, and have a talk on mood disorders, talk on anxiety disorders, a talk on uh, psychotic. And we'll go into much more detail in those times. But that gives you a sense of, of how the spectrum you know, can be applied with that. So we're going to take about five opportunities to ask questions. So as we're doing this, I'd like people to uh, either type in a question, and I already see one in there, so I'll be coming on that one in a moment. Uh, also, if you're brave, go ahead and click on the raise your hand button. There's a little smiley face by the attendee list, and in that smiley face, if you click on it, it'll say raise your hand. If you raise your hand, that means you're wanting us to call on you, and we can open up your webcam and your audio and actually talk with you, which is kind of fun. If you do that, use earbuds. I'm using earbuds today. You can see this is just little iPod kind of earbuds, but that'll prevent feedback. And just plug it into your computer uh, if you can do that. So let's go ahead. I'm going to switch to uh, to video. Yeah, okay, we'll do video. And so here's um, some questions. We've got uh, 20, 90, 10. We've done that. Uh, Lisa says, there's also a concern about treating adolescents. There seems to be a risk of over pathologizing normal behavior. There are significant implications of diagnosing young people when there really just might be a developmental short-term issue that resolves. Uh, okay. Uh, and um, Yes, absolutely. That is a, a huge controversy and, and issue. I think you indeed see it much more in adolescents because any of us that have teenagers uh, or that don't have teenagers realize that uh, adolescent behavior can be you know, very amplified and it may be a completely normal phase and it may not be pathologized at all. Um, so yes, moving to the spectrum uh, has a risk of that. You could also say it is also allowing you to normalize you know, some behavior in the spectrum. Uh, but yeah, for adolescents, I think that's even, even more so. Um, and Evanson has a question. Uh, let's go ahead and do the Evanston question, then if there's time, I'm going to go to back with the other ones. There may be a flaw in the analogy using creativity as a measurement of bipolarity or any other disorder, as much as the creative process may draw on other sources not subject to quantification. Audio just isn't working. Sorry about that, guys. We'll have to test it more before we <laughs> try the, the audio again. I guess just feel free to have people you know, come up to Evanston and type that in. Uh, I'm sorry about that. That works so well in the, in the test. Okay, um, so Paul's question. Yeah, yeah, none of these models you know, are certainly perfect with that. You know, creativity as measurement by polarity you know, in the creative process may draw on other sources not subject to quantification. This doesn't ring true as an example of empowering the subject. Um, yeah, I can certainly see that, that viewpoint. Um, and there are many other pieces you can look at besides that. For the clients that I've had, it's, it's been a very helpful construct. Most of them seem to connect well with that, and we've seen it be very useful within that. Um, but yeah, there are all kinds of different views you can look at. Uh, let me go down. Um, let's just turn the speakers. Yeah, we're, we're trying to, to do that as well. Okay, let me shift. I'm going to go to video and text. I can read these better. Uh, Len Cruz, Lisa's thoughts are vitally important since the adolescent experience subsumes wide-ranging manifestations in part fueled by a process of trying on various 
personas and removing them. A snapshot at any time might over pathologize things that are normal. Yeah, totally agree with that. Uh, okay, here's just this question. Emerson, will the DSM-5 we can buy now this month include all the ICD-10 parentheses that will we have in October 2014? Yes, that's a uh, excellent question. The, well, it should. I can't say 100% because my copy hasn't arrived yet either. Uh, but yes, the press releases that I've seen with it say that the DSM-5 will indeed have ICD-9 codes, but also ICD-10 in parentheses right next to it. So that, that should indeed be the case. And if anybody has gotten their book yet, anybody from San Francisco, if they've been tuned on, go ahead and type that in. But yeah, I think that is indeed the case. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and move on. Uh, I apologize for the Evanson piece. That just didn't work like it did in the test. Maybe the speakers are on a little bit higher, or maybe there's some computer feedback. Anyway, we probably won't try that again until maybe the end. We can try it one last time to see and we can hold audio questions from Emmonston until the, the end, and we can play around with it a little bit then. Um, but, but in the meantime, Jessica, just go ahead and have anybody who has a question at any point, just go in and type it in. And then when we're able to review the questions, I'll scroll down and look to, to see for that. Okay, so let's, let's move on a little bit. Okay. So we're going to spend some time on the diagnostic disorders then themselves. So first up is mood and depression. And we indeed have a, a new uh, diagnosis, which is called persistent depressive disorder, DSM-5. And this includes chronic major depression as well as previous dysthymia uh, or dysthymic disorder. It's been used by both terms. So dysthymic disorder is no longer a diagnosis. And persistent depressive disorder is it's not a complete change one for the other because persistent depressive disorder includes not only what we used to call dysthymia, um, but also chronic recurrent major depression. Uh, and the reason I think that's an improvement because with dysthymic disorder, it was always difficult to diagnose because he had to prove or at least try to determine that they never had a full episode of depression in the first two years. And how do you really do that? That was a very subjective call. So now if somebody has chronic, you know, persistent depressive symptoms, they can do so with, uh, they can call it persistent depressive disorder and no longer, you know, if you have that question with dysthymia. Another new full diagnosis is premenstrual uh, dysphoric disorder. Many of us have been using this already, uh, but it wasn't an official DSM you know, term. It was in the kind of not yet fully recognized piece. Now it's been promoted up to a full diagnosis. And of course, that's basically PMS, premenstrual you know, syndrome, but there are specific diagnostic criterion uh, that will be available for premenstrual dysphoric disorder. The other piece in the mood disorders is that with the, uh, with depression and with bipolar uh, and anxiety, we have now specifiers. And that's, again, Go to yellow, that'll show up a little bit better against the red. But specifiers are showing different uh, areas of the diagnosis. So that if you have depression, you can add a specifier of bipolarity by saying that depression has a mixed feature specifier. If they have depression but anxiety, you can add a specifier of anxiety into it. So again, that's what you're seeing more towards the spectrum that depression, bipolar, and anxiety really aren't necessarily 100% discrete diagnoses, but they, they have a, a wide you know, range. So you can be more depression than the others, but you can say depression with bipolarity and with anxiety. And these specifiers allow you to do so. So again, that's an example of the spectrum piece. A possible controversy is the bereavement you know, change that bereavement is no longer an exclusion to diagnosing depression. Patients can actively be going through a recent grieving process and still be diagnosed with depression. What that means is if somebody was in bereavement and they were going through the grief of losing a loved one, uh, officially you weren't supposed to diagnose depression uh, until a certain amount of time had passed, saying that bereavement is normal to have depression symptoms, so they were sort of exclusive. Um, 
And we have a poll question. Yeah, let me do the, I think I messed up the slide. So let's go to the poll question, and then we'll go back to the depression cartoon. But the poll question is a quick one, which is, uh, what do you think of bereavement? Do you prefer DSM-4, where people actively grieving from the loss of a loved one should not be diagnosed with major depression uh, because it's a normal part of the grieving process, or do you prefer DSM-5 that just because they're going through grief doesn't mean you can't diagnose you know, major depression? So go ahead and click through that and click Finish Survey. And I'm going to scan through the chat there. Yeah, I'm not sure again with the Emerson. We're going to hold off on the audio for this time. Okay. So go ahead and, and close that out. There we go. The summary in regards to bereavement and depression. The majority, not by a wide margin, but 44% say I prefer DSM-4, where actively grieving lost of loved one would exclude major depression. Okay, so that controversy people you know, don't like, you know, the, the new change as well. Um, and that's one that's been in the newspapers, you know, the various journals uh, to some degree. Okay, with depression, let me see what slide. Yeah, there, you can just hold it there. Uh, Ryan, I'll take over the slides. So this is our cartoon that Luke also did on uh, depression. And, and Paul's right, you don't have to look at, at just you know, these axes. There are all kinds of axes you can use. But as we were developing these you know, spectrum images, you know, these were ones that came to mind that showed uh, usefulness, uh, but also problematic elements at the, at the pole you know, of that. And for depression, you know, our image of a spectrum with shallowness versus despair, how much sorrow do you hold? You know, this end of the spectrum being somebody who's kind of shallow, can't hold much sorrow, and this one being the opposite, kind of too much. Uh, shallow and different, this person's kind of walking past, you know, somebody in need. Uh, this person is suicidal, you see the, the looking at the noose. And the in-between, you know, we're conceptualizing as somebody that can hold sorrow, this lady, is comforting this one who is is grieving and and that's a healthy expression of, of empathy and sorrow so the goal is not to become shallow and impervious to depression uh nor to stay in your depression unless you know it's kind of a maybe in here and it's kind of helping your growth process but if it's in here we really want to get it down to sort of a healthy uh sorrowful but yet yeah, not depressed in state and the evanston was the opposite, really. So two people prefer DSM-4, the old version, and 10 prefer DSM-5. So that actually flipped from the rest of the poll. So that makes it kind of an even split between you know, all of our cohorts, both in Evanston and around. OK, so let's keep going. We did that one already. Uh, any questions? I'm not going to stop formally for questions because I feel like we just did that. Um, but go ahead and type in any questions. And I'll actually, one just popped in, so let me read that one. I understand about the labels regarding depression and major depression and appreciate the, I'm assuming that's concern. Uh, oops, I lost it. Let me roll my chat back up. Uh, Hold on, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to go to this mode. There you go. Thank you. Um, uh, da, 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 there it is. I understand about the labels regarding depression and major depression and appreciate the concern. I think that by not excluding bereavement, we're able to catch those whom bereavement has perhaps tipped the scales into major depression. Yeah, and that's the, the, the two sides of the argument um, that you, know, you still want to treat sometimes, but you also don't want to pathologize bereavement. Bereavement is also a normal response to loss, whereas major depression has entirely different conceptualization. 21st century life already tried to rush people through the grief process. Adding a potential diagnosis to the picture is not helpful. Yep, I can understand that. Question, with the spectrum then, is it relying much more on clinical judgments? Yeah, yeah, I would say 
that is something that we're, we're getting at. Overall, of course, clinical judgment needs to be a major part of that uh, and, and should be regardless. The biggest criticism, rightfully so, of all the DSMs is that it's a cookbook, that it's, it's simple. You go through the criterion A, B, C, D, E, and if you get five criterion of this for more than two weeks in the absence of this, then you have major depression. And that's taking out any kind of clinical wisdom and judgment. So regardless, DSM needs to, you need to be very careful and not use DSM as a cookbook. But I think you're also right that the spectrum uh, enters even more um, diagnostic judgment, clinical judgment, where you're trying to discern where they are in there. There's not absolutes, but a, a spectrum. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, the loss of nuance here seems crucial. Rather than shallow, there can be enormous block pain, which is hardly shallow. Oversimplification may be pedagogically effective, but leave out great deals in addressing the underlying dynamics. And that goes back <clears throat> to the clinical judgment in that, yeah, absolutely. In this kind of talk, we are very much distilling very complex issues down into much more simplified you know, pieces with that. And and that's the danger both with DSM uh, as well as our spectrum analysis of if you don't you dive into the complexities, you're going to be uh, missing uh, something. Uh, Carolyn writes, good question, Megan. Oh, right, here we go. With the loss of bereavement, pardon the pun, are adjustment disorders then similarly affected? With the loss, okay, <laughs> right, the loss. With the loss of bereavement, are adjustment disorders then similarly affected? <clears throat> we'll talk adjustment disorders are no longer mood disorders. They are now traumatic disorders. So we'll talk about adjustment disorder within the, the trauma you know, subsection. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, that affects that as well. Uh, okay, let me move on. There is lots of discussion in the chat and keep that discussion going. Um, even if I'm not able to read all the questions and answer, um, Len Cruz, a, a cohort of mine, is on and typing, and he can actually answer some of those questions, too. He's got a lot of expertise in this area. So keep the chat going, and every so often, if there's time available, I'll uh, dive in and bring that into you. But I like the chat questions so far. They're, they're really going nicely. Okay, bipolar disorder, not too much change with bipolar. There is an emphasis in increased energy and increased activity, the levels of the criterion, but the criterion don't change too much. Going back to yellow, because I like the yellow on blue for some reason. And then, but again, they have a specifier. So I like that addition that just like depression, you can have bipolar with a anxiety specifier or a uh, depression specifier. So that kind of makes sense. Schizophrenia has been, uh, has seen elimination of the five previous subtypes. So those of you probably remember from DSM-4 as well as 3R and 3 that there was catatonic schizophrenia, disorganized, paranoid, residual, undifferentiated, sometimes hard to distinguish. So if you did a lot of work with schizophrenic population, uh, we saw a lot of paranoid. Uh, paranoid disorder, paranoid schizophrenia is probably the, the most common, um, but uh, no longer are we distinguishing those. Catatonia, though, still is a specifier. So if you're catatonic, you still can specify that you know, in the diagnosis. This is our cartoon you know, for psychosis. This one was harder as we were trying to think through um, how can you look at what's a normal expression of psychosis. Um, what we decided on, on this spectrum, again, you can look at it under different ways, but the one we came to was visionless versus psychotic. How strong are your dreams and visions? Are your dreams and visions overwhelming? so much so that you're psychotic and confusing them with reality? Are your dreams and visions non-existent? Are you somebody who just can't get inspired? Uh, of course, this is going to overlap with depression. This could be a depression sign. Um, or somebody like Martin Luther King or Mahatma Gandhi or really anybody that has been a inspiring, uh, inspirational, vision-filled person. Um, that kind of person is more in touch with visions, hopefully, not at the psychotic level, but sometimes dream, dreamers and visionary kind of overlap with uh, some bipolar or even psychotic thought process. So it's not uncommon to kind of be fuzzy. Is this somebody who is brilliant or is this somebody who's psychotic? So that line can become a rather fuzzy line. So that, that's our image of spectrum of psychosis. And again, we'll be talking about this in much more detail when we do individual. We'll do an entire 
you know, 90 minutes on uh, psychotic disorders and on bipolar disorder and, and others. So I have more time to go into there. Let me go to anxiety disorders. With anxiety, they lost two disorders. Actually, they, they moved, but obsessive compulsive is no longer an anxiety disorder. It is now a obsessive compulsive disorder. And trauma and stress-related PTSD used to be under the anxiety disorders, but no longer. Uh, we now have agoraphobia. We kind of always had agoraphobia, but in DSM-4, it was lumped with panic disorders. So they were, they were uh, connected in essence. They disconnected them, and you can diagnose agoraphobia in the absence uh, more easily of panic disorder. Then separation, anxiety disorder, and selective mutism. These are both real, ch mostly childhood disorders, and they have uh, moved those. Yeah, into the anxiety. They used to be in the child section, now they're in the anxiety section. So when you look up in DSM-5, you look at anxiety, these are the ones that are coming and going. Uh, okay, uh, Evanston question, what is OCD now categorized as? I'll bring that up in just a moment. And, Steve? yep, go ahead. Steve, and this yep, is we have you, Len. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted to make a few comments, um, partly born of the chat room and mm -hmm. some just to frame the conversation. You know, I look at DSM all the way through its various iterations and evolution as being in part originally, I think, a somewhat um, unsuccessful attempt to establish for researchers some consistent criteria by which as we kind of um, did investigation, there could be some coherence. I think the, the, the unfortunate thing is that quickly became a tool for securing reimbursement. And so my comment, and perhaps in some ways an answer to some of the questions that have been posed in the chat, um, is that a regrettable consequence has been that it, I think it made it very easy, and I'm not sure DSM-5 will resolve this, to see the map as being the same as the territory, that you know the function of having some tools so that there's some coherence for research, useful, but then again, um, we shouldn't reduce people to these categories. And I think one of the comments mm -hmm. that Paul made is relevant is, although this is good for pedagogical purposes to kind of have a spectrum, it kind of um, encourages us, which I think, especially those of us um, interested in depth psychology and Jungian um, um, treatment should be more attuned to not letting this be so reductionistic. And I saw Paul's comment about where would, where would you put Jung um, of the Red Book on the mm -hmm. spectrum? I don't know. Sometimes I suppose it'd be appropriate to put him in the realm of madness, um, brilliance, mm -hmm. everything in between. And so, you know, one of the things I think we should just be mindful of is the purpose of DSM-5 might regrettably be um, to allow us to have a, a means of billing. Um, mm -hmm. To some extent, it's a research tool. Um, which I noticed the question about the NIMH rejecting mm -hmm. DSM-5 might be precisely because it's getting fuzzier, maybe more useful, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but less precise. And I'm not sure that's a bad thing. So as we go mm -hmm. through the exactly. continued descriptions that you're giving us of a spectrum, maybe we can all kind of be weighing that issue of how can we keep DSM-5 in its proper place? It's a tool that's been imposed on us that mm -hmm. we have to live with. Mm -hmm but let's never make the mistake of seeing people as if they fit into that procrustion bed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That, that's very well said. And thank you so much for monitoring the, the chat and, and being able to summarize that so nicely. It's a little bit hard sometimes for me to be going back and forth. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, very well said, because I was aware of the MIMH as well and, and that controversy. And I think you're right on target. It, it really goes back you know, to you do want clearly defined categories that are great for research and statistics, or do you want clinically useful kind of blurred images that kind of help you in the room when you're, you're trying to clinically evaluate somebody? Um, yeah, I would fully agree with that. Um, and back to, you already said it, but I'm going to kind of say it again. Of, uh, but yeah, Carl Jung um, was not here <laughs> whatsoever. Um, nobody can accuse Jung of being a boring, uninspired guy. Uh, what they've accused Jung of, of course, is being psychotic sometimes. There are people that look at 1913 and the break and, and some of the Red Book as was he you know, lightly out of touch with reality or not. 
or was he right here, a visionary um, into some realms touched into the collective unconscious, you know, deeply involved, um, but not kind of into that psychotic. And again, that'd be you know, the visionary, the, the Martin Luther King, uh, et cetera. So that's the debate. You know, was Jung here or was he here? Yeah, and um, great question. It, it's, it's, it's good. So, okay, next slide. This is our anxiety cartoon. I won't spend too much time on this one. Again, we'll be spending more time yeah, when we dive into the, the specific uh, sections, you know, one by one. But, uh, but this is the uh, anxiety you know, piece, meaning that if anxiety is a spectrum, it goes from carelessness to anxiousness. If somebody has no anxiety, I would argue that they're reckless and careless. Anxiety is useful and helpful. If you're walking a tightrope across a building and aren't anxious, then you haven't taken appropriate uh, precautions, you know, et cetera. So, uh, but nor should we go through life you know, terrified, full of panic. Uh, Luke's drawn this person with a helmet and a pillow strapped his chest and, and boots and knee pad. Um, so this is somebody who can't live life if they're so anxious. This is somebody who's going to die as they won't fall off the, the wire. Uh, but this is somebody who is enjoying life. Got the convertible, tops down, going, hopefully not too fast, uh, but enjoying life. And that's kind of right in the middle somewhere. So again, from a spectrum analogy, that's our conceptualization of, of that piece. So back to Jessica's question about the uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. There's a, a new section now that is uh, called the obsessive compulsive disorders. So no longer an anxiety disorder. It's a obsessive compulsive disorder. And in the realm of obsessive compulsive disorder, that chapter or that section includes OCD, includes body dysmorphic disorder, trypophilomania, uh, hoarding disorder, and excoriation, skin picking disorder. Uh, these three we've always had, these, and we've always known these are sort of OCD you know, oriented you know, disorders. Uh, hoarding has in the past been more a subset of OCD, of some OCD patients were hoarders. Um, but now we're saying hoarding disorder is a diagnosis of its own. You can be a, a, a hoarder, but not necessarily have OCD. Of course, there's going to be a lot of comorbidity. You, know, you might have OCD, you know, plus trichotillomania, plus hoarding. Nothing wrong with having all those. Excoriation disorder, obviously very close to trichotillomania. Um, I'm sorry, I haven't defined that. Maybe I haven't yet. Trichotillomania is hair pulling. So hair pulling. Uh, is trichotillomania, and usually severely so. People have large bald spots where they, you know, picked and twirled and actually just pulled that hair out of their, their head. Sometimes they go entirely bald in trichotillomania. It can be body hair. It doesn't have to be just hair on your head. Um, and skin picking disorder is just that, where you, you, you have an, an, an imperfection of the skin, you pick and you pick and you pick, and you pick so much until it just uh, ulcerates, and, and I have patients that are covered with skin ulcers, uh, literally just from excoriation you know, disorder. Up till now, I didn't have a, a full category. I kind of said they're OCD, NOS, not otherwise specified, but now they have excoriation uh, skin picking disorder. So that's the OCD kind of category. OCD, our cartoon for that. Uh, we actually lumped with ADHD, and maybe this isn't fair. Maybe uh, people won't like you know, this uh, uh, conceptualization. But for this one, what we said was if somebody has too much attention, they are too focused, they can't let go, and they have OCD, and they're obsessing uh, on something, or they're doing a ritualistic compulsion. But if they have too little you know, focusing, then they have ADHD, and they're, they're not uh, able to focus. So on our scale from zero to 100, uh, how much focus how much focus do you have? If you have zero or close to it, then we're conceptualizing that as ADHD. And they're fast moving circles, um, not literally, but can't sit still as well, can't focus, mind jumping around. And if you have too much focus, if you can't let go of focus, that's OCD. So you're unable to uh, let go of things. And this person has a counting ritual. Everything counts as three, you know, three towels, you know, three books, three, et cetera. And any of us working with OCD, you know, will have patients that uh, have number, you know, obsessions. And everything has to be a certain number. They have to balance it. And it can't be an odd number or it can't be an even number. Um, yeah, and of course, the goal is to be in the center. So here's a young man who's sitting, paying attention, and looking at the board. So... 
keep typing in the questions, and, and Leno will kind of keep working with the questions. I think I'm going to keep going through the slides to try to get through the presentation itself, and at the end, we'll kind of scan back through the, the chat box and kind of see. And then we'll conclude with, we're going to try one more time with Edmonton to see if we can't you know, get them you know, live and speaking, but if not, we'll just keep with that chat you know, with them. So there's also a new section called post-traumatic, uh, I'm sorry, called uh, trauma-related disorders. And the trauma-related disorders used to be under anxiety. So PTSD was an anxiety disorder, uh, but now it's its own section called the trauma-related disorders. They also have acute stress disorder, which you've always had. That's sort of a, a briefer PTSD, one that hasn't gone six months, I think, the exact criterion, but is more acute. Uh, adjustment disorders, somebody mentioned, I think it was Evanston, about adjustment disorders. And uh, adjustment disorders are no longer mood disorders. So forever, uh, I've been conceptualizing adjustment disorder as, as often a mood disorder, sort of a, more of a mild uh, sort. But uh, now they're saying, if you're having an adjustment, it's to something traumatic. It might just be stress at work or divorce. Uh, but there's a, a probably milder trauma than you're adjusting to it. And a reactive, oops, sorry, a reactive attachment disorder, clean that up, is a, formerly it was in the childhood you know, section, and now they moved it to the, uh, the trauma-related uh, section. Who of you, and type in the chat box, you maybe have already, but who is bothered by the necessity of a preschool subtype? So now, if you have PTSD, you can have, uh, regular PTSD, or you can have preschool subtype PTSD. And I think I see that as an indictment of our, of our time, society, and even Newtown. I know that was a preschool, that was elementary school, but how sad that, that we have a separate diagnosis for a preschool subtype. Len, I saw you pop up. Do you have anything to add with that? And that's fine. Maybe you might still be muted. Um, and there's been some, some chat pieces in there. Uh, so anyway, um, here's a preschool. So preschool would be, yeah, go ahead, Len. Can you hear us? Uh, Len's having some technical difficulties. Let me read Laura's comment. Preschool would be useful for early childhood sexual trauma. Right, exactly. And I'm hoping that's more what they're getting at of, is this just somebody who's been traumatized under the age of six? Uh, so yeah, it still is an indictment of child abuse within our, our country. Um, but yeah, I think you're right, they're probably more getting to that, but that's a chilling uh, phrase, a preschool yeah, PTSD. Um, okay, let me move forward. Eflin, if you want to jump back on, if your microphone kicks back in, feel free to, to do so. Next section is dissociative. Disorders, that's dissociative amnesia, dissociative identity disorder. It used to be MPD. I forget which one that was. So multiple personality disorder was one of the earlier DSM reiterations. Steve? Uh-huh, yeah, go ahead. My, my thought about the uh, preschool subtype was just simply the possibility that perhaps they're trying to recognize the ease with which children not really dissociate, but they enter into fan fantasy life return to ordinary consciousness and maybe that's an attempt to mm, differentiate mm -hmm, what shouldn't be kind of considered. I mean, we recognize trauma, mm -hmm, but maybe mm -hmm. kind of overlook some of the features that um, shouldn't be pathologized since, you know, children's um, ability to deal with trauma through, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. through family. Yeah, exactly. Capitalism. Have a less mm -hmm. rigid boundary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's well said. And there are a number of chat comments on that. I was just reading through those you know, a moment ago. Um, yeah, and there certainly is something you know, different uh, neurodevelopmentally. And of course, with language, yeah, that you know, preschool, uh, preschoolers have language, but certainly uh, not to a developed enough degree to really process you know, through these materials. Uh, of course, elementary school, yeah, that's an issue as well. But yeah, thank you very much, Len. I think you're. you're yeah, nicely uh, bring that. Um, Evanston, where do war-related PTSD go 
as compared to PTSD from TBI. Um, yeah, right, right, exactly. Um, PTSD from war would be uh, regular you know, PTSD. And I do wonder, will they have a combat subtype? The press releases and the material I've gone through so far from the APA didn't say they were going to have a war subtype. Uh, but yeah, a war subtype PTSD you know, would be quite significant. We'll get into neurocognitive uh, disorder in a little bit. Uh, some of that are the, the physical results of TBI, traumatic brain injury, and we'll be talking some about that as well. But, uh, but war trauma would certainly fit under you know, the general PTSD, and they might give us a, a war not subtype for that. Oh, good, thank you. Talked about those. So what happened to alcohol abuse and alcohol dependence? Alcohol abuse, alcohol dependence are no longer the, the DSM. So that's certainly that, something that's going to um, be noticed you know, by folks. Um, it hasn't really changed dramatically, but there are some significant issues. There's now alcohol use disorder. So it's no longer, it's no longer distinguished. There's not alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence. There's just only you know, alcohol use disorder at this point. But there's also the spectrum integrated in, and they, they've done so with, with this, in that depending on how many criterion you meet, you're allowed to have mild, you know, moderate, or severe. So again, it's got a spectrum. It's just that instead of the spectrum being A or B, alcohol abuse or alcohol dependence, it's just alcohol use disorder, and then you can specify mild, moderate, or severe you know, with that. And then there's alcohol intoxication as a separate diagnosis, uh, or alcohol withdrawal as a separate diagnosis. So if you look at alcohol, there's three diagnoses, alcohol use disorder, alcohol intoxication disorder, alcohol withdrawal disorder, and then you've got mild, moderate, severe, kind of within that. And substance use disorder, uh, just meaning that there's a lot of substances besides alcohol, of course. There's a long list in DSM-5, uh, but each of these will have their own disorder. So you'll have cannabis use disorder, opioid use disorder, hallucinogen use disorder, et cetera. So uh, they'll all follow that same uh, diagnostic criterion uh, and there will also be cannabis intoxication, cannabis withdrawal, et cetera. Um, gambling disorder has been recognized as an addiction, so it's officially in the substance use disorder chapter and section. So gambling is seen as a substance, at least in regards to the uh, addiction. I'm not aware of sexual addiction, you know, internet addiction, those sorts of things in there yet. Although it'll be interesting to see, do they add other things besides just the gambling and disorder? Here's our slide on addiction. And again, we, we put that into a, a scale. For this one, we didn't shade in uh, this area as problematic only because uh, it could be a problem if somebody you know, just wasn't able to enjoy life and, and wasn't able to kind of engage fully enough, but there's a lot of people that really strive to not have possessions and to uh, be disconnected from uh, things in life. Uh, Buddhist, Buddhism is very much like that. Uh, monastic lifestyles are like that. So we didn't pathologize this, but we said this is somebody on this end of the spectrum, meaning uh, an ascetic yeah, monk versus multiple addictions, how much pleasure do you see? So if you're not really pleasure or possession driven, like a monk or a Buddhist, then you're kind of down here on the scale. And if you're highly addictive uh, personality, then you're up here. And we wrote the in-between. Somebody can enjoy you know, life in a uh, modest way. So here's a couple you know, having uh, dinner, enjoying a night out, so there's somewhere in between. These people are smoking marijuana, a little bit of reefer there. There's an alcohol kind of spilling. They're kind of wide-eyed and look sort of on something. There's drug paraphernalia kind of on the bottom here. Um, so that's our spectrum within the, the addiction kind of elements. And again, that's just one of many ways of looking at it. Personality disorder. And I thought I know the slide. I oh, know there is. There is. Um, Anyway, personality disorders really aren't changed other than they're no longer an axis 2. So that's the, the big change is personality disorder is no longer an axis 2 you know, diagnosis. Um, uh, but the disorders themselves are pretty unchanged. So I'm not sure if everybody knows about clusters, but there's cluster A, 
and B and C, and and the subtypes or the personality disorders are are identical. So paranoid, schizo, schizotypal, uh, etc. And the diagnostic criterion for those have remained unchanged. Uh, at least we're told. I haven't again seen the full criterion, but the the pre information suggests that these will be all the same. Um, okay. Comments. See, the aesthetic is still in some research, in some respects, sorry, and yeah, pursuing pleasure. It is pleasure framed in a higher aspect. Yes, that is, is very well said. Uh, let me delete that. Um, and this one, I agree. This one, I we kind of had to stretch to, to get there. Um, but I think it still fits, particularly in, in, in some aspects. But you could say that uh, a Buddhist or a, a monk is very happily and pleasurably praying and doing things. And pleasure, I was thinking more hedonistic pleasure. So, you know, things that typically a Buddhist or a ascetic monk might uh, leave uh, behind. So pleasure might not be the, the best term, can I, but can hedonistic. Can I have a follow-up? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Go ahead. Uh -huh. you know, it strikes me sometimes how in the course of various DSMs, we've lost some good words. For example, back in the old days, DSM true, so I'm admitting I'm one of those guys. Uh, there was mm -hmm. a word that we used to banter around, asthenia, that quality mm. of being zapped of your vital energy. I wonder if that might not be a better descriptor of the other end of that spectrum. That mm -hmm. it's that ability, that, that inability to experience pleasure, to be animated, to kind of lose all your vital stuff. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Not have the desire to be in pursuit of it. Versus mm -hmm. kind of the ascetic who just sort of makes a conscious choice. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. I think that's a that's a good way. Um, I have to think how the cartoons were looking for that, but yeah, yeah. And that may be uh, Megan mentioned that as well. Perhaps detached versus addicted. Um, yeah, there's something that's not quite fully satisfying with with having it. Uh, you know, of, of if you try to pathologize you know, Buddhism or monk. But again, we that's why we didn't shade this in. We didn't call this problematic. But yeah, I like that. I think that's a good way of looking at it as well. Uh, Rochelle, I might not be saying that right. Will change in personality disorder not being access to, will that allow it to be covered by Medicaid? Uh, great question. Of course, you know, we don't know the answer at all to that. Um, yeah, don't know. Don't know. We'll have to see. You know, will that make it you know, something that's you know, more respected and reimbursed with that? Of course, you know, there are ways around that right now. I mean, you can diagnose probably an adjustment disorder if it's applicable and an active two personality. So I suspect those that have treated personality disorders were usually able to find a access one diagnosis that was, was relevant as well. Um, but still, it's a nice question. Would it you know, cover if it was better if it was no longer access two? Evanston, OCD was listed under personality disorder. We thought OCD was its own category. Yes, that is a, a very good question. The difference is obsessive compulsive disorder versus obsessive compulsive personality disorder. And that is confusing. And I know lots of folks, myself included, that have, have kind of struggled with that sometimes. Those are actually two different diagnoses. So if they have obsessive compulsive personality disorder, that's one diagnosis. And they have obsessive compulsive disorder, that's a different diagnosis. So it's confusing. Um, but but those are different diagnoses, even though most of the, the title is the same. The only difference is adding the word personality in front of disorder with that. But yeah, that's a good, good question. This one is probably also controversial, but we were trying to look at the spectrum of personality in really the area of ego syntonic and ego dystonic. And that may be too psychodynamic for folks. Um, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the range within personality disorder is somebody who is uh, egocentric, and that's this person right here. I love this cartoon. This guy is saying, what I did was all your guy's fault. Which is kind of absurd to even say it that way. But we all know people with a strong personality disorder who blame everybody else. You know, what I did was your fault. This person is overblaming themselves, more the neurotic stance. Everything is my fault. And this is kind of the in-between. Yeah, it's partly my fault, partly uh, your fault. So again, that's that in between, which is the problematic side uh, with that. Okay, dementias. Let's shift over to what used to be called dementia. Now is called 
neurocognitive disorder. So dementia no longer exists, but it does exist in uh, this term. So major, go back to yellow, major neurocognitive disorder really is what we used to call dementia in DSM-4. And mild neurocognitive disorder is what we used to call mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive impairment isn't a DSM diagnosis, but gerontologists, psychiatrists, and neurologists would use it all the time. Like this person has mild cognitive impairment. That means they have some mild dementia like symptoms, but not fully. And then there'll be subtypes. So you can have a major neurocognitive disorder from Alzheimer's, from vascular, multi infarct dementia, substance abuse, alcohol, especially traumatic brain injury. Remember, you talked about TBI and vets returning from overseas, or really any traumatic brain injury football, soccer, really anything, uh, HIV infections, Parkinson's, Lewy body disease, prion disease, and Huntington's disease. I won't go into those. Those are all neurologic conditions. And they all have, uh, can be you know, diagnosed with a, a major uh, neurocognitive disorder. And I'm going to skip this poll question, actually. So just for the sake of time, I notice we've got about uh, five to 10 minutes left. Um, but the, the poll question would have been, uh, what do you think? I'll leave the poll question up, but Ryan, don't change to it. Uh, is it bad to add mild neurocognitive disorder, in essence, the MTI, or is it good? That really gets to that same issue that we've been talking about of by moving to a spectrum, is that helpful or does that overdiagnose normal aging and processing? Okay, we've got a couple more slide sets, but we're almost done. So the disorders of childhood are, are now uh, called neurodevelopmental disorders. And that's trying to get more towards a neurological perspective you know, within brain development. And some of our research is focusing on that. And this is a big controversy, especially the Asperger's change within this category. So there's autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder. Again, that's a spectrum. ADHD, ADHD really hasn't changed much. The diagnostic criteria are pretty much the same for ADHD. There's communication disorders that can be speech, social, or stuttering. There's intellectual disorder, formerly called mental retardation, and that's probably a welcome change for, for many families. And then there's learning disorders, reading, writing, arithmetic, and then motor disorders, you know, Tourette's and tics. Those are the childhood ones. I want to spend a little bit of time on some of the, the changes within that. Probably the biggest one is autism. Uh, Asperger's and childhood disintegrative disorder are now all rolled into autistic spectrum disorder. And, and that means, really, there's no longer a pure Asperger's uh, disorder that you can call just Asperger's. What you can say is within the, again, the spectrum of autism, which you don't have a slide for at this point, Within the spectrum, there'll be different levels, you know, one of which would have been what we formerly called Asperger's. It's, it's you know, this level of autistic. And of course, a severe or pervasive developmental disorder, severe autism would be kind of far down on the, on the slide you know, for that. Uh, and let's go ahead and do this poll question. I want to go ahead and run this. So Ryan, throw up this poll question in regards to the rule of Asperger's you know, disorder, the fact that we changed it you know, from having its own diagnosis to being part of a spectrum, do we see that as uh, the old way, DSM-4, was clinically useful distinction and should have been retained as its own Asperger's, or the idea of autism spectrum is equally good construct and allows us more flexibility, or no opinion. Usually I didn't let people get away with no opinion, but for this one, I thought I'd throw that in there just to see if there were any thoughts along those lines. Let me, yeah, good, okay. And most people say Asperger's was clinically useful and they regret its disappearance. Yeah, not by a huge margin, but by a significant margin. And very few, no opinion. That's interesting that very few people had no opinion yeah, at that. And Evanston, go ahead and uh, send that in when you're uh, ready and we'll be interested to see that. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide in just a, a moment. There we go. So we did that poll question. Uh, social communication disorder. If only social communication and interaction are impaired, then it's social communication disorder. That's you know close to Asperger's. So yeah, Asperger's 
uh, you could say it could be you know, partly in there as well. Uh, this is a nice change. I think most people kind of welcome this change. So intellectual development disorder uh, it replaces what's currently called mental retardation. And nobody wants a label of mental retardation because that's, you know, teasing in school and all kinds of reasons why really politically they, they needed to change that. The other interesting piece, you know, with that is that uh, it's more on adaptive functioning. In DSM-4, it was really all IQ score. And you can look it up. If your IQ was 84 to 89, you know, you had this level of mental retardation, you know, et cetera. Uh, with Evanston, Asperger's, uh, nine people uh, like the old way with Asperger's and seven like the autism. So that was pretty similar to our, our poll as well. So a little bit more people uh, favor the Asperger's piece. Okay, so Maddox symptom disorder is a new diagnosis and it, it lumps together a fair amount. It lumps together somatization disorder hypochondriasis, uh, pain disorder, and undifferentiated somatoform disorder. And so, and, and to me, it looks like it simplifies a fair amount. I don't know if you remember somatization disorder, but there's a long list of, I think it was 14 or 15 uh, symptoms. They had to have so many of the symptoms, and it was really a bear. If you are on the consultation liaison service and you're trying to diagnose it, it was really kind of cumbersome to, to diagnose clinically. The bean counters probably liked it, and the, the folks that were doing research on it. Uh, but now it's really to what degree is physical illness leading to psychological distress beyond what the physical symptoms would typically cause? That's the other question for somatic symptom disorder with that. We're almost done. I think we have just, I think it's the last slide. So we'll have time maybe just for the last question or two and a wrap up after this. Gender dysphoria, I would say, is, is kind of along the lines of the, the political you know, piece, uh, not quite back in 1970 when we were diagnosing homosexuality as a clinical disorder, but uh, work has continued to try to destigmatize you know, these sorts of issues. So gender identity is no longer a gender identity disorder, you know, but it's gender incongruence. And so what you can see there is that, that they're depathologizing the title I think they've left it in DSM-5, and that, that could still be the focus of clinical uh, treatment. If somebody uh, was really conflicted on their, their gender and, and needed help either with their family or with you know, personal issues with it, uh, you would still want to be able to use it clinically and diagnose it. Uh, but they destigmatize it somewhat by taking away disorder. The other difference is gender dysphoria is no longer uh, in the same section as sexual dysfunctions and sexual paraphilias. I think there was something offensive to some people of seeing it uh, similar to pedophilia or other you know, paraphilias, uh, and they moved it into uh, a different category, so it's no longer uh, with that. And that is it. So that is our presentation for the day. Uh, I've got just a few more thoughts, and then uh, we'll see uh, if we can uh, make sure I'll review the. Um, chat box in just a moment. Um, but so anyway, so today was a overall summary of DSM-5. I didn't pretend to think that we could uh, really go through DSM-5 in 90 minutes. There's no way to uh, give a full understanding. But what we tried to do today is give a, a nice overview so you see the bigger changes, the spectrum and the removal of the axes and the, the various you know, elements within them. Um, as well as, as the kind of mess of some of the, the new diagnoses and some of the controversies. And what we're hoping to do then is now take each section and go into more detail. So in July, I think it's July 9th, we're going to call it DSM Tuesdays, where one Tuesday a month we'll try to spend 60 to 90 minutes and spend the entire time just on depression disorders and, and include in some of that uh, diagnosis, treatment, medications. Not a lot of time on that. will be more about diagnosis. Uh, we we'll like people to bring cases, so if you have a case that you can alter enough so you're not revealing any, any confidential material, you could you know, present a case and what diagnostic category would fit in. Uh, we'll do that through chat or through audio box. Um, but uh, hopefully we'll have a, a nice uh, continuation of people joining us for uh, clinical symposium, really, on the different sections of DSM-5. It will be an opportunity for us to learn about DSM-5 as you go along. Uh, and dive into the sections a little bit more so. Um, 
Len says, uh, dysphoria is an unpleasant affect and a bad feeling. Uh, let, me, let me switch. I know we're out of time. If anybody needs to sign off, go ahead. I'm just going to take another couple minutes just to look at. Yeah, good. Go ahead and pop that up. Let's review that. And Evanson, we're going to try one last time now that we're officially over uh, to open up your microphone and see if we can talk. Let's not do it quite yet. Let me read through the chat. But in a moment, we'll see if we can turn on your microphone for a moment again. Uh, oh, I see. Sorry, I forget what this was dysphoric. Uh, Len answered that. D dysphoric just means uh, sad. It's a jargon for, for sad. Uh, is sex addiction included in the addiction section? That's a really good question. Um, I don't know. I haven't, haven't been able to figure that out yet. Uh, certainly the paraphilias are in their own. So pedophilia and, and uh, you know, other philias uh, are in their philia section. Sexual addiction, I would hope, would be in the regular addictions, but I haven't yeah, seen that yet. Uh, here's a thank you. Anything else that I should read? Um, make most of these other comments we got to. Len, let me know. Go ahead and turn on your microphone if I miss any comments you want to comment on before we close. Otherwise, I think we got most of them. And Ryan, as we're about to close, try to turn on the webcam in Evanston, or maybe Evanston, you can do that. And if you guys can't, then just. Steve, I think you hit yeah. all the, the questions that were in there, but if the thought occurred to me like you, I haven't been able to discern where to some of the things that we think of sexual addiction. I wonder if will we still be able to just, I guess we can't do impulse control, not otherwise specified. <laughs> impulse control disorder. So will there be mm -hmm. a broad basket mm -hmm. for impulse control? disorders that we can still kind of fit things into? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. And um, yeah, we'll have to see you know, how they, they fit in, you know, some of those. Um, there was, I'm, I'm blank on exact diagnosis, but there was an impulse control disorder. I don't have my notes immediately in front of me. Um, but yeah, I did come across that, that there was a, a maybe in, in, in bipolar section, that there was a Something similar to that, so an impulse dysregulation syndrome or disorder, something along those lines. But there was, it wasn't in the addiction area, it was more in the, the mood and the mobility you know, phase you know, with that. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Anne says repeat Len's question. Uh, not sure which question. Um, Evanson says, Steve and Ryan will pass on the audio for now. Thank you. We will know. We think we know what the problem was caused by. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, we're really hoping that Evanston can uh, continue in some of these, if not the DSM, perhaps some of the uh, Zurich you know, ones that we're going to restart as well. The other interesting thing that I should have mentioned earlier is we will be uh, changing the, the Zurich time zone. We've got a, a lot of feedback from people uh, about the time frames. In our old system, many of you that have done the seminars with us probably remember that we would do them during the day, usually Thursday morning, 11 o'clock uh, Eastern time zone. And that was because we were at a university, the University of North Carolina, Asheville, and we could only do it during business hours. We couldn't use weekends. That really limited people's ability to tune in you know, with us. What we're doing now is really focusing on evenings, at least in the, the U.S. time zones, and Saturdays. So uh, like tonight, you know, we're doing it in an evening. So people that work and get home and can, can do it. We did it at 8 o'clock so that the Western, the West Coast could still join us at 5 o'clock, hopefully not too early for them. Switzerland, we cannot do it at 2 in the morning. So we decided to do Switzerland, Zurich presentations from uh, on Saturday uh, morning. So Saturday, midday, and noon uh, Eastern time to about 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, which is evening in Switzerland. So Murray Stein and the cohort there have already scheduled three seminars for the summer and fall that will all be based off shorter uh, time frames and Saturdays. So Saturday morning, noon will be the time frame for that, and 90 to 120 minutes with that. And I think that'll be a lot better. It'll be using this technology. You'll be able to see and hear them. You can ask questions. You can type. We can figure out the, the audio. We'll get better and better at it as we go along. People will be able to ask audio questions right from the computers if they decide, or chat questions like what we're doing. But we're going to try to really integrate uh, Zurich into a, a more user-friendly kind of format with that. 
Uh, and again, if any groups like Evanston has done tonight, if they want to join us and and have groups, you can use that as a fundraiser you know, to split the proceeds uh, and or you can uh, get connected. And I think we'll get the audio video working better in Amos, uh, soon. So um, let's go ahead and close. Uh, we want to thank everybody you know, for you know, our uh, talk and today we had a lot of people attending. I love the chat questions. People did a wonderful job typing in chat. Please keep doing that subsequent ones. We hope you can join us in July when we do the, the mood disorder you know, section. And with that, we'll bid everybody goodbye. Thank you again and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.